Hello, and thank you for coming to our workshop on creating uh, plural safe spaces. Uh, our name is The Ring System. We are an OSCD 1B system of about 40 plus people who have been engaged in disability justice work um, and other mental health activism since 2018. And in all of our time being in plural spaces, discovering our plurality, um, existing as plural through the world, we're really excited to share our knowledge that we've gained, just like existing living through the world with our lived experience. Um, we collectively use they, them pronouns, um, and we're really happy to be here. And we'll give it off to our co-presenters. Hi, uh, we are the Alexandrite system. Um, we are a uh, plural OSDD system of uh, 25 to 30. Um, we are uh, intercommunity educators and content creators, and uh, we really enjoy um, just... Uh, educating in both our own communities and in uh outside of our communities as well um and before we move on into the main content of our workshop i have a couple things to say first um first off this is a neurodivergent and disability friendly space which means uh feel free to use this space in whatever works in whatever way that works best for your body so you can turn your video cameras off you can turn them on feel free to stim in this space feel free to fill the space as you so desire um and then secondly uh secondly this presentation overall has a section about discrimination so i want to give a quick content warning for general ableism discrimination medical abuse. I'll give more warnings as the presentation continues on, but I just wanted to quick heads up right at the beginning. And then finally, um, this presentation for a quick visual description is a orange and white presentation. The background is like a very light orange and all of the words and lettering is in a dark orange color. And throughout the presentation, there will be various floral designs. For any images that don't fit this general theme, we will describe them individually. For example, on this intro slide in the bottom left hand corner, in the bottom right hand corner, there is the plural emblem, which is a Venn diagram with overlapping circles. There are four different circles and each circle is a different color. Um, they're purple, yellow, green, blue. And as they mix together towards the inside of the Venn diagram, they create a, a deeper green, an orange, a deeper purple, and a deeper blue, eventually fading to white in the center. Um, so to start off this workshop, we first want to acknowledge that like people, plurality is a subject that's not often talked about, as even in disability spaces, even in mental health spaces. So there's probably audience members who are coming to this workshop who just don't have a basic conceptualization, conceptualization of plurality, and that's okay. Um, so we're going to start this workshop by talking about that subject. What is plurality? So basically, um, plurality is uh, the experience of being many people in one body. Um, it can mean a lot of different things. Um, it is um, an umbrella term that encompasses the more specific uh, terms DID or OSDD. Um, but uh, anyone who defines themselves as more than one person in the same body, um, even beyond the DSM criteria for either DID or OSDD, um, can consider themselves to be plural. Um, and it can often be a um, a personal or political identity as well as uh, a um, a mental health condition for one person. Um, one thing to note about the plural community is that we are very diverse, very broad community. Um, and with that diversity, there's a lot of diversity in the language and the ways that we conceptualize ourselves. Um, for example, with language uh, under the umbrella of plurality, it encapsulate anyone who identifies as more than one. And what is considered more than one is up to each person and their conceptualizations of themselves. So some words people use to describe the entities uh, of more than one entities in one body are people, entities, parts, system members, alters, states, personalities, selves, individuals, insiders, etc. cetera. Uh, the word we're, get, we're going to be using for this presentation is system members, simply because that's one of the most neutral terms out, out there. Um, and then secondly, to go along with that, uh, the conceptualization of self uh, for people who identify as plural is very diverse. There are plural systems who consider themselves very distinct, very highly differentiated, uh, where each system member is as different from each other as two physical, physical people are different from one another. 
And then there are systems who, on the other side of the sliding scale, don't consider themselves as dis differentiated. They might have system members who are close, really close to each other in sense of self. They might be blurry, blended a lot of the time, share same names, share traits, etc. There's this really broad spectrum of how plural folks conceptualize themselves. Um, but overall, there's a there's a shared foundation of having, on some level, a distinct sense of self and a distinct conceptualization of self between system members. And then finally, the key thread that you will see running throughout this entire workshop is that the most important part of supporting plural people generally is respecting our system members' individuality. So, and we're gonna to be touching on this in a lot of different um, forms and a lot of different experiences, but that is the key theme this entire time to respect people's individuality and to reflect that in your language and interaction with them. So to move on real quick, um, something that we want to do before moving to the abroad, <laughs> before moving further in this presentation is just give you some common definitions. The plural experience is one that's very, very different from a lot of other experiences. And because of that, our community has come up with a lot of words used to describe that experience that aren't found elsewhere. Very simply, one you've already heard before is system, multiple, and plural. These are all words to describe plural folks, people who are more than one in any sort of way. System tends to be more of a noun word, whereas multiple and plural tend to be more adjectives, uh, but they're really all interchangeable. Secondly, DID and OSDB1, which we've mentioned already, are as dissociative identity disorder and other specified dissociative disorder dash one. Um, these are disorders that often form from trauma and they result in multiple different alters with distinct senses of self. Thus, because of this, people with DID and OSD fall under the plural umbrella, though they don't make up the entire community. And because these are disorders, uh, their plurality is uh, entwined with some sort of distress, often coming from trauma or dissociation that they experience. Something that we have also mentioned but haven't named uh, is simply the system name. A system name is a collective name that a group of entities within one body collectively identifies as. For example, our system name is the ring system and our co-presenter system name is the Alexandrite system. And then the next word, singlet, is simply someone who is not plural, someone who only has one entity within one body. Uh, this is very similar, just how cis is to trans, just how straight is to gay, it's the non-marginalized identity, the normative identity compared to plurality. And along with that, there's plural phobia, which is discrimination against plural folks. Uh, and then on the other side of the slide, I'm going to be covering um, experiences uh, that systems often have. Um, fronting is um, whoever is in control of the body and its actions at that moment is fronting. Um, Co-fronting means that two or more system members are uh, in control of the body at that time. Uh, Co-consciousness, um, typically one person is fronting and another person uh, is not in control of the body, but is uh, watching, observing, maybe reacting, um, that person is co-conscious. Um, a switch is a change from one person controlling the body to another. Um, feeling switchy is uh, feeling as though you might, you might switch, you might have that transition. Um, blurred and blurry are uh, the feeling of multiple people fronting, but they're not significantly differentiated from each other. Um, it's often a very unpleasant and disorienting, disorienting experience, and it uh, tends to go with a lot of uh, dissociation. Uh, dissociation is um, the feeling and um, experience of being disconnected from your body and yourself and uh, your, um, your surroundings as well. Um, and then the opposite of dissociation is uh, being grounded. Uh, when you're grounded, you are um, more in touch. You're firmly in touch with your uh, your body, yourself, and your surroundings. And then something we really just want to get out there right away is this common misconception about plurality is 
that there is a real person, a more important person, um, and one entity, one system member that makes all the decisions, that is more important, et cetera, et cetera. And something we want to make real clear is that there's no most important person. There's not one system member that's more real than the rest of us. Um, everyone is equal within this brain. When considering DID and OECD, you hear a lot of metaphors that focus on fragmentation. So we'll be compared to shattered glass, broken vases, but personally we aren't a fan of insinuating that we are broken simply because of the way we exist. Uh, so a metaphor that we like to use much better is the metaphor of a tree. So when you ask the question, which one of you is the real one? which one of you is the most important one. It makes just about as much sense as which branch, which branch is the real tree. And this is because all of the branches of the tree are all equally important pieces of a whole, just as all system members are equally important parts of a system. Um, there's no branch that's more important and there's no system member that's more important. We all work together. Yeah. And because of that, um, it's not that there's there's never usually one system member making all of the decisions. Sometimes a system's specific structure will be structured like this, but most of the time life is shared and so is decision making. Um, and then, and because of that, moving through our lives, collectivism is key. So many different system members work together in daily life whether that's in healing, in therapy, in managing relationships, in simply getting daily tasks done and progressing through the world, we work together as a system and we're responsible for ourselves as a whole. Before we talk about this, we are going to be briefly mentioning um, integration slash fusion uh, for any systems or anyone out there who is uncomfortable with that topic. Um, this slide uh, contains two pictures. On the left uh, un, um, are several paint tubes all um, mixing into one pile, um, whereas on the right there are several paint brushes of different colors, each with um, their own little splotches of paint underneath them uh, that are blended but distinct. There are two typical goals uh, that systems um, who are seeking treatment for their plurality uh, move towards. Um, there is uh, fusion, uh, also called integration. Uh, the terms are often conflated in our communities, even though they do mean different things. But please know in this uh, presentation, whether we say fusion or integration, we are probably meaning the same thing. Um, Fusion is the act of uh, bringing two or more system members together into one system member. Um, the idea being that uh, eventually all system members will become one. Um, it was uh, historically the only uh, treatment that was available to us for a long time. Um, I believe it only really started falling out of fashion in the mid 2000s um and uh it uh if you if you wanted to seek treatment you had to be okay with this um even though uh only one third to one sixth of people with did successfully uh integrate or completely fuse um and even then um in, in 2019, Dr. Emma Sunshaw found that 78% of the 863 plurals that they had surveyed had no interest in complete fusion. Um, they instead preferred the idea of healthy multiplicity. Uh, this is also called um, resolution. Uh, the goal here is to um, break down barriers between system members, um, get memories moving back and forth between system members, because that's often a problem with DID. Uh, get everyone um, more on the same page, resolve conflicts and things, uh, and then live that way. Um, unification through distinction. And now that we've kind of explained plurality uh, and gotten everyone on the same page, I think it's time to do a little bit more in-depth introductions from the two of us. So as stated before, we are the ring system. We are 
a OSCD 1B system of 40 plus people. Once we pass the 40 mark, we just kind of stopped counting, uh, both because there is a lot of stigma about higher numbers and also because we just happen to like the number 40 and it feels nice. Um, so our system works. Uh, we have a group of five to six to seven people who correspond and make up a host team. So there's six to seven of us that uh, five of us are active at any one time, and then one to two of us are taking a break. And the five of us up in the front are S, Silver, Roan, Diane, Aaron, Anna, and Peach. And beyond that, uh, the seven of us work together and we've created this presentation and we generally blend together. We're very blurry and have a lot of permeation between the boundaries between us. And we generally create a lot of content together. Uh, beyond us, we have the rest of the system. We have a couple caretakers. We have some older women, Lorianne Montana. We have uh, the one single token man in our system, Spike, and just a large variety of people who, and just generally get along. We work together as a team. We've definitely had our in the past, but we're doing pretty good together. Um, and then we'll hand it off to the Alexandrite system. So uh, we are the Alexandrite system. Um, specifically, this is um, both Camilla and Sandra presenting today. Uh, we both use she, her pronouns. Um, um, we are uh, two of the four members of what we like to call um, our council. Uh, basically, um, myself, Sandra, uh, Susan, and Claudia in our system, um, ages 31, 27, 28, and 13, respectively, um, all uh, make um, key decisions within the body. We are the ones who front the most, and uh, we are we are the ones that um, that get heavier say. In, in life decisions, not to say that we make all of them, because we do like to uh, make it as much of a group decision as possible. Um, but uh, for day-to-day -day things, it's typically just the four of us who, who consult each other. Um, uh, we are an OSTD 1B system as well. Uh, we have 25 to 30 members, as we mentioned. Uh, that number is... Um, very much subject to change as we uh as we go through our recovery and and um find more more wonderful people that we share this body with and now we're going to move into the real bulk of our presentation which is what is a plural safe space how do you create it what do you need to look out for um, and the first thing to know about creating a plural safe space is that it must be trauma and dissociation informed. As I mentioned before, people with DID and OSDD, trauma and dissociative disorders make up a decent chunk of our community. Uh, so including plural people generally means including them. And we need to make spaces safe for anyone struggling with trauma, anyone struggling with dissociation, people struggling with memory issues, especially because that's a huge problem with TID. System members do not have memory between them and experience amnesia. Uh, so this means there to this means incorporating a lot of accessibility measures that comes with learning about trauma-informed spaces, such as grounding spaces for people, using content warnings, and similar things. Um, and frankly, <laughs> teaching you about, teaching the audience about how to make a space trauma and, dissociation, trauma and dissociation formed is enough content to fill one to two more workshops. So what we're going to do is we're going to tell you to make your spaces trauma and dissociation informed and then send you out in the world and trust that you learn that information yourself. And then for the rest of this presentation, we're gonna focus on how to make spaces specifically plural safe um, and plural, and accessible for plural folks on top of trauma dissociation informed spaces. Similarly, safe spaces must be trans, queer, autistic, and disability friendly. Um, this is first off because that there are large portions of the plural community that also have lived experiences as trans people, as queer people, as autistic people, as disabled people. There are, especially with the trans and autistic community, there are large, large chunks of the plural community that share those identities. Um, there's a common phrase in the plural community, which is, if you know enough trans people, you know a plural system. 
And that, uh, that amount of commonality it really goes to show the overlap. There have been no official studies done on this percentage, just simply because it hasn't been accepted. Um, the question has been proposed to a couple of really large surveys, but it's been turned down every time. Um, but regardless, trans, queer, autistic, disability-friendly spaces are important for creating plural safe spaces. This is also because there's a lot of common accommodations between these identities. For example, gender neutral bathrooms are really great for non-binary and trans folks, but also for systems that have both cis men, both cis women, trans non-binary system members. Um, as we switch in and out of the front, having a gender neutral bathroom, so both the cis men and the cis women in the system feel comfortable using that space, is a lovely accommodation for plural folks. And then finally, the most important thing about creating a plural safe space, as I mentioned before, is that we need to be seen as individual entities worthy of respect. Individual system members need to be acknowledged as our own autonomous, conscious, self-directed entities. Um, and that our individual needs, when we have separate needs from the other members of our system, need to be met. So I'm guessing that by now, uh, some of you are probably thinking, well, I, uh, I haven't met any systems, um, and I've not really heard about this before. Why do I need to accommodate for this? Really, this is fairly rare, um, but that's not true at all, really. Um, it's, I, I mean, it is commonly believed that only a handful of people in the world are plural, um, but studies have shown that DID on its own affects one to three percent of the population. Um, that doesn't even include OSDD, which, uh, on top of it, um, on top of that one to three percent is suggested to be another four to seven percent. And then there are systems that, um, do not for fit the criteria for the DSM or, um, do not, uh, medically label their plurality. So, honestly, we don't know how many systems there could be in the world. Um, but... Even just working with that 1% to 3%, uh, red-haired people are about 2% of the world's population. Uh, so if you know a red-haired person, odds are you know a system, because that falls right between the 1% and 3%. Um, I know that um, in, this, in this vein of the, the myth of rarity, uh, we know a system from the Netherlands, who when they were diagnosed were told that there were, I believe, only... 80 people in the Netherlands with DID, which is so wildly off base. I believe the Netherlands has a population of 17 million people, which would mean the floor of that would be 170,000 systems. Um, bit of a far cry from 80. And we're going to move right into a discussion. Uh, for audience members, we have one of two questions to pick from. The first one, which is, what is an example of plural phobia you have seen before? Um, or if you have, can't recall an experience of plural phobia that you saw, um, what do you think an example of plural phobia would look like? And we're just going to ask folks to just popcorn if you'd like. If you have any thoughts, if you want to respond, just, just throw it out in the void. And we actually have uh, singlets in the audience tonight. So we can, um, you know, don't don't be shy. And a hush falls over the crowd. I mean, I could give the same one I gave on Monday, which is usually you can only put one name on any given form. Yep, very true. Um, in the chat, uh, one person says the movie Split. Um, yeah, the movie Split is uh, somewhat notorious in the community for being um very very harmful uh to the the public perception of um of plural folks especially those with did um whenever it comes to masking as one person and basically having to sort of like hide uh, that, that there's multiple people within this body rather than just like one person working. Yes, definitely. So uh, another another one from the chat, uh, legal IDs in general. Um, 
a, a big problem. I know that there are a lot of systems that have uh, very large disagreements with um, what name, if they, if they end up changing their name at some point, um, because, you know, there is a lot of overlap between the trans and plural communities, um, what name should go on uh, their official IDs. Especially at the intersection of you can't put a system name and it's also dangerous to be out. Yes. Uh, internalized plural phobia mentioned in, in the chat. Um, feeling like I'm catfishing when system mates have their own social media. Yes, definitely. Internalized plural phobia is deeply, deeply harmful. Um, but, you know, as most internalized uh, internalized things come from, uh, it comes from the influence from from uh, the outside world. So the only time that I talked to a therapist at the end of the session, she decided to copy my accent, which is not really great because it felt like she thought I was just having a go at it. Like, no, it's just how I sound. It's not a choice. <laughs> yeah. That's, I'm sorry. Yeah, we have some system members who sound similar, and that that would deeply hurt their feelings as well. All right. Um, there are a couple more in the chat, but um, I believe that we're gonna start start moving on here, just for time's sake. Thank you, everyone. So we're gonna start with identifying plural phobia, um, because as facilitators of spaces, one of the most important things you can do for any marginalized community is to identify um, discrimination when it happens, call it out and prevent it from happening. Um, because if you have any marginalized community in their space and they're being actively discriminated against by other people in that space and it is just allowed to happen and the facilitator does not step in and prevent that from happening, they automatically feel unwelcome in your space. They automatically shut down, they stop expressing themselves and sometimes they just leave the space altogether. Um, so it is a very key point, key, key part of creating plural safe spaces is identifying this plural phobia when it happens and then making sure to shut it down so it doesn't continue to happen. Pleurophobia can come in many different forms, just as all discrimination comes in many different forms. It can be, it can occur in microaggressions, it can occur in social isolation, social conformity, social discrimination, interpersonal discrimination, and it can also occur on larger, bigger scales, such as legal and carceral discrimination, which isn't something you can really address in your spaces and prevent, but it's something that you can support plural folks with when they experience it. And to counter plural, plural phobia in your spaces, you will need to be able to recognize it. Having an understanding of plural phobia, why it is hurtful, why people are saying it and how to counter it helps you support plurals who are struggling with discrimination either in your spaces or struggling with, with discrimination outside of your spaces. And that allows you to be a support for them that they might not have elsewhere. And as we're talking about this in the next couple slides, we're going to be talking about common forms of plural phobia and common forms of discrimination plural folks face. So I want to give a quick content warning. This is gonna be the difficult part of the presentation. We're gonna be talking about invalidation. We're gonna be talking about ableism. We're gonna be talking about medical abuse. At some point, we're gonna be talking about CPS um, and children being taken from their parents. It's getting a little hairy in there. So I want to let you know ahead of time and we can continue forward. So uh, first off, we're going to start at the at the base, I suppose, of this of this um, unfriendly pyramid, uh, denying or questioning the plural experience uh, with quotes such as I don't want to encourage this fantasy. Your system members aren't real, uh, but you're all one person. Uh, and my personal favorite, did you diagnose that yourself? Um, anything that um, denies or disbelieves the lived experience of plural people. Um, it, um, as we talked about before, the uh, myth of rarity um, really uh, works against us here as well. And also the, the common perception that um, DID is a Hollywood myth, um, that it is implanted by therapy, um, that, uh, you know, because it's rare, people who um, come to come to discover it for themselves 
are potentially hypochondriacs. Um, you know, did you diagnose that yourself um, is especially insulting because um, the psych community as a whole um, is so uh, deeply not prepared for a system to walk into their office. Um, I know that our therapist personally said that um, her uh, her professor and one of her professors in her um, uh, master's program said that they were going to skip dissociation because uh, you will never have a patient that deals with dissociation. Um, and of course, now her whole caseload is dissociation. Um, but um, the unfortunate fact is that um, it takes systems on average, I believe, seven years to uh, to properly get diagnosed with uh, DID or OSTD. Um, I know uh, we personally uh, went nine years in the psych system before we eventually had to figure it out ourselves and bring it to our therapist. Um, a, a previous therapist than the one that we mentioned. Um, but I think that uh, just making sure that you are uh, not not denying or questioning anyone's experience is a key first step here. Understand and accept this on the basic, basic level, foundational level. But after, usually a common form of discrimination, after people get past accepting plurality as a real thing overall, that this is a real phenomenon that's occurring to people, is expecting or forcing plural people to become one. Um, and there's some, we listed some common uh, examples of phrases of this type of discrimination. There's quotes such as, can't you just make them go away? This is unhealthy. Plurality is unhealthy. And I can't wait to, until you're one person again. Um, this is fundamentally, it comes from the assumption that living as plural is inherently a hindrance. It's inherently unhealthy. And that hindrance is either to the plural system itself or often a hindrance to others around their life, that it makes relationships hard, that you it's very hard to be in a relationship with plural people, either friendships or romantic relationships, or that plurality is something that inherently hinders our life. And that plurality is a negative state of being that needs to be fixed to become normal again. Um, this is a common trend in a lot of disabled, a lot of ableism, a lot of discrimination against disabled people, but it is very harmful to come out to someone to talk about your plural experience with someone and to have one of their first reactions be and understanding your identity is something that is harmful and asking when are you going to get rid of that identity because it's something that's harming you um when in fact it's it can be just a normal healthy part of our experience as we talked about in the slides covering different uh, treatment methods, different goals that plural people pursue. Healthy multiplicity means resolving any trauma, any dissociation, any interpersonal people for those who don't fall under a pathological lens, um, any miscommunication, solving memory issues, but still staying multiple, still staying plural, still being healthy, uh, not being pathologized under the DSM. And to have this assumption that plurality is always something negative, always something unhealthy, is harmful when it can be a normative, happy, healthy way of living for a lot of plural folks. And along those lines, after someone kind of passes through, okay, this exists, okay, you're not gonna become one again. The next thing a lot of people do is they deny personhood to system members. And this falls under a concept that the plural community calls host centrism. The host is a word used to describe the one person in a system who fronts the most, for systems that have that structure where there's one person who fronts the most by a good amount and everyone else fronts a little bit less. Um, and it focuses, the idea of this concept is that that, that host is really prioritized all of, above all of the system members in other people's minds. Um, so this, it, it comes with some quotes like, I only want to speak to whichever of you has the same name as the body. I only want to speak to whichever of you fronts the most. Can I just talk to the real you? Or I refuse to use the other system member's name. Um, 
And this all comes from a fundamental assumption that plural systems are what we like to call singlet but a little weird, where the person who is uh, enacting this discrimination on, on us doesn't actually see system members as autonomous individuals worthy of respect. Instead, we are treated as abstract symptoms of a disorder or personality traits that can be ignored um, and not seen as the people, as the entities, as who we are. Um, yeah. Similarly, seeing uh, system members as um, uh, one dimensional, um, a single uh, a single emotion or a single uh, duty that they fulfill. Um, on the slide, we have Ivy is the angry one as uh, a quote there. Um, I think that uh, in the beginning, it can be hard for singlets to understand that um, we very much are uh, all our own people and we are not just just the angry one or the one who goes to work or the one who um, who goes to parties and things. Um, it's uh it can be very very harmful because it it pens you into a box and it makes um it makes you feel like uh people don't want you around outside of that and uh for some um you know people who are called the the angry ones um aren't wanted at all and it can be pretty deeply hurtful to have people who, you know, are are your friends, your family, um, not react to you well, but react to everyone else well. It's it's very deeply hurtful. Um, and on top of that, the idea of postcentricism is such a a flimsy concept. Uh, when it doesn't hold up to scrutiny because the idea uh um the role of host can change over time and often does um we've had several host changes over our lifetime we actually had one recently um sandra uh who's also here right now uh was um our main host for a for a few years um and then uh last month i actually became our main person and um, it can also really uh, depend on whoever the singlet in question meets first, because um, the person that you meet first isn't necessarily going to be the host um, or isn't necessarily going to have the body's name. Um, for example, um, I play chess and I have a uh, a chess teacher, a chess coach, and uh, she uses um, my my chosen name, uh, Camilla. And um, I had mentioned to her that that I have the ID, um, and uh, it went over well. And um, uh, it it actually turned out that I wasn't the first system that she had met. Um, myth of myth of rarity busted again. And the interesting thing that I took away from that conversation was that this was the first person that I ever had to come out to uh, because Sandra was typically the one to to uh, be the first person that somebody meets and then they meet me later and I'm I'm the different one. Sandra is the default and I'm different. But I now have a person who views this body and reflexively thinks Camilla. And if Sandra were to be out, uh, I'm sure that, that my teacher would be like, who is this one? Can you please bring back Camilla? It's all very subjective. And I think that it's important to know that you might not know the whole picture. Uh, and similarly, um, this is a a uh, topic that is near and dear to our system's heart. Uh, you can't be trans if you're plural. Um, we are collectively a trans woman, um, and uh, there is 
a lot of overlap between the trans and plural communities, as mentioned before. And there is specific trans and plural discrimination, um, often around things like denying hormone replacement treatment or uh, gender affirming uh, treatments such as that. Um, if you have a DID diagnosis or a suggested DID diagnosis, and it all comes from the idea that um, plural people and really mentally ill people in general can't and shouldn't make decisions about their own body. Um, it also has this weird back and forth where uh, you hear both, you think you're trans because you have DID, and you think you have DID because you're trans. Um, uh, the, the former being, you know, you think you're trans because you have DID because you have... Uh, um, system members of multiple genders, uh, some of which are different from the body's assigned gender at birth. So you're not really trans, obviously, you're just uh, expressing that form of your mental illness. Or, you think you have DID because you're trans, you're wanting to see your past self as a completely different person, so that you can further distance yourself from it. What they don't think about though is that when you have that past self as a system member you do in fact have to live with that person um when you know you can just ignore it and pretend you never had a childhood like a lot of trans people do um but i think that it's very it's very harmful because a lot of these um a lot of these uh, treatments, these gender affirming treatments that are um, that are sought after by by trans folks and trans systems are often life saving. Um, so to deny these people these treatments is to put them at serious risk, and it is very harmful to the point where a lot of uh, trans systems will advise other trans systems to not disclose their status as plural to their doctors, their surgeons, sometimes even their therapists, because you don't know who is going to be on your side. And the last category we want to talk about is a category that has a lot of similarities with other forms of ableism and other forms of discrimination, which is the belief that plural systems are less than singlets. Um, this comes with phrases such as, I couldn't imagine life like that, and how could you possibly be a good parent with DID? Um, and very similar to the disabled community, this comes with a lot of assumptions about our quality of life, um, whether our life is a good life to live whether it's a worthwhile life to live with the assumptions that it's not, or our capability, our ability to hold down a job, our ability to hold relationships with other people, hold healthy relationships with other people, our capability to be parents, um, and all this stuff. And this manifests on a systemic level. Um, children, there have been multiple instances of children being taken away from their parents because their parents are plural. Um, there's also a whole bunch of incidences of medical discrimination where people who have a DID diagnosis are taken off the wait list for organ donations. Um, it's just really bad. And something I also want to point out is that all of this stuff, especially the systemic stuff, impacts systems of color on a much higher level than um, white systems. And especially when it comes to the fact that DID is a highly stigmatized diagnosis, um, it falls in the category of very similar categories like schizophrenia, OCD, other stuff like that. Um, as people with disabilities, especially uh, systems of color with disabilities are at a lot higher risk for police violence. Um, and just are, especially with all of the overlapping mar marginalizations and overlapping discrimination are just at a much higher risk for this systemic discrimination that plural people experience. Um, and something, I just wanna close this section by saying that institutional plural discrimination is really complex and it goes far beyond what we could cover today, especially 
uh, medical discrimination and discrimination that occurs in the medical industrial complex. It's a really complex history. It's a very deep history. It's a very harmful history to plural folks. Um, but because that's not the center of this workshop, and because we could teach a whole nother hour and a half workshop specifically in the history of plural discrimination, it's beyond what we can cover today. Um, but what I want you to understand is that plural folks face a lot of difficulty in this world, and having an open space to talk about our struggles in a singlet normative and plural phobic society is an important part of supporting the plural folks in your spaces. Basically, believe us and listen to us when we talk about what we experience and be there as a support for people who are dealing with difficult things in your spaces. So now that we've talked about some of the ways in which you can spot and recognize um, pluralphobia, let's talk about the ways in which you can practice being a good plural ally. Um, so what does meeting our needs look like? First of all, uh, let's deconstruct the idea of uh, singlet normativity. Uh, singlet normativity um, is along the same vein as uh, something like heteronormativity, the idea that um, people are assumed straight until proven otherwise. Um, in this case, uh, everyone is assumed to be a singlet until proven otherwise. Um, as we discussed, uh, the myth of rarity, there are a lot more systems around you than you realize. Um, odds are you probably know at least one system in your real life already. And, you know, I'm, I guess I'm just going to say it. It could be you. <laughs> um, you know, all of us thought we were singlets until one day we were proven wrong. Um, but I think that um, if you... Uh, break down the idea that one body equals one person, and you let systems unmask, let them so let them be authentic um, with their with their plural selves. Let them let them switch. Let them use their names. Let them just be themselves. I think you'll find that those systems that you may know might come out of the woodwork. And along with deconstructing uh, singlet normativity, something that we want to be aware of is this concept of body-centric language. And specifically with that, we want to move away from language that automatically conflates bodies with personhood. Um, so this is language that when you say a phrase or when you say a sentence, it assumes the personhood of physical entities with how many bodies that are there. Um, and one quick example of this is the question of how many people are presenting this workshop. And you might very quickly say, oh, there's two people presenting this workshop, but that is in fact not true. There's at least four people presenting this time because the Alexandrite system, uh, as Camilla and Sandra are co-fronting, and we're blurry. So there could be anywhere between two to five people presenting in this workshop. We've switched at least twice during this presentation. Um, so there are more than two people presenting this workshop. And that initial assumption of, oh, there's two people presenting is an example of kind of body-centric language. You look at the bodies that you can see and you make an assumption about the personhood from those bodies. And that is reflected in the language that you use to describe the people you are around. And because of this, body-centric language is something that is very contextual. It often involves that direct see sight to sight thing where you see a body and you assume the personhood um so oftentimes this happens when most often when you see people walking down the street or you just see people in person and you assume their personhood based on how many people are there like oh there's two people walking down the street because you see two people with two bodies walking down the street um and oftentimes this is very easily fixed just by focusing and really looking at what you are trying to get by saying uh, by using body-centric language. I think one example that's really easy is like if you are hosting a gathering and you say, oh, we need to feed five people today. That is assuming personhood based on bodies and it's very easily switched to, oh, we need pizza for five. Um, and what the five is is not specified, but the implication is that it could be persons, it could be bodies, uh, it could be entities, any sort of thing in there. Very similarly, you can switch, would you like a table for two people to would you like a two-seat table? Um, it's just this gentle shift that doesn't imply personhood when it's not needed. Um, and yeah, something along these lines, though, that I want to talk about really quickly uh, before we move on 
is I want to acknowledge that finding alternatives for body-centric language in general conversation is something that is very, very difficult. Um, body <laughs> I can't talk. Body-centric language is something that is built really deep into just the language you, you we use as a society. There are very few words um, that are meant to capture the meaning behind what we are saying, which is um, tallying the amount of bodily entities that are in a space without inherently implying personhood or being dehumanizing. Um, and walking that line is something that can be very difficult. Um, in spaces where everyone in the room is plural, in completely plural spaces, something that we often do is we just kind of like fall right into that dehumanizing uh, zone because we have a very distinct separation from our bodies because there are multiple experiences of consciousness within our bodies. Um, our sense of personhood is inherently divorced from our body in some sense, in some way. There are plural systems who are very connected to our body, their, to their body, but it's often in a different way than singlets are. So in these spaces, we just simply say, oh yeah, there's five bodies in the room. <laughs> we'll be like, oh yeah, we have to order pizza for five bodies. Um, but for singlets whose sense of identity and sense of personhood is really entwined with their body, mentioning their body like this can be something that feels inherently dehumanizing and it's something that feels inherently off-putting very wrong. Um, and that's something we also want to acknowledge in this space that oftentimes there can be conflicting needs between plural, plural community members and singlets um, and how they want to refer to their physical presence in this space. And because our language is so sharply divided into these two categories um, of personhood or humanizing, it can be really hard to find um, in-betweens. Personally, we've been trying to work on this for a while, um, and this is the best version of it that we can give to you. Um, the best thing that we have come up for in terms of language is the word entities, because it doesn't inherently imply personhood. It could be multiple entities. It could be bodily entities. It could be mental entities. Um, but overall, we just want to acknowledge that this is a difficult part of the process and that it's more important to recognize and take note of where body-centric language is uh, arising and then approach those situations with empathy and understanding and how that intersects with the plural experience than being perfectly correct all the time. And along with that, uh, we're gonna start to get into things you can do structurally to make your spaces safe for plural folks. Um, and I'm going to start with a very, a very obvious one, which is, when you introduce yourself to spaces and when you enter spaces for the first time. So this is entering spaces, becoming a part of spaces. Um, and the first thing that a lot of plural people really, really want, and something we've mentioned at least a couple times during this presentation, is allowing the use of multiple names um, or system names whenever someone enters a space. So this can be in things like intake forms, in check-ins, on documents, on name tags, any sort of thing that, uh, or any sort of thing or situation that requires that you identify yourself. Um, and allowing the flexibility in names is something that's really important. Um, and one very concrete example uh, that is very relevant to everyone who's here in this space is this conference itself. Um, when we went to register this workshop for the conference, we had to put our first name and our last name in a form to make sure to, to submit this workshop. And there was the two boxes. There was a box for your first name and there was a box for the last name. And we collectively, our presentation, our activism work is under our collective system name, the ring system. And upon giving this, be, receiving this form, we had two options. We have first name, the, last name, ring system, or we have first name, the rings, last name, system. Um, and both of those options don't feel the best in your mouth. And after a couple years of workshopping, we've gotten so many emails back that say things along the lines of, hello, the, because our first name is the, and that's how the automated email addresses us. And those forms are something that is inherently inaccessible to plural folks because we can't authentically use our name the same way that other people can authentically use their names when filling out these forms. Um, and names and allowing us to use our names 
I'm, I'm allowing system members who use their names is something that is really important for plural people generally because our names are really important symbols of our individuality, of our for of each system member's personhood, of their existence. Um, being able to use our names is something. Oh God, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, I'm gonna get back on. Yeah, because for so many years of so much masking, um, it's one thing to mask your behavior, but it's a whole nother thing to mask your name, to use someone else's name for your entire life, to constantly have to learn to respond to a name that is not yours. And a lot, it's, it's ex an experience a lot of trans people can emphasize with, and it's something where those experiences hold hands in that way. Um, but having this access basic ac accessibility of having a spot on your form that says name, names, or system name, is something that immediately signals to all plural people entering that space that this is a safe place where they can use their names and when they can identify themselves by themselves. The second point I have uh, for you is to ask who's present in the space without assuming that one body equals one person. Um, this is for things such as like check-ins or just general like going around the room, introducing yourself, that sort of stuff. Um, and Something that's really important about this is, or just like a key idea is that the more structure you have, the more it kind of shuts plural people out. So if you have a structure that's like, give your first name, give your last name, give your like where you went to school, like give your occupation, like and a hobby. Um, that is a structure that it, it's very hard to fit in as a plural system. Like there might be two people co-fronting, you might be blurry. You might not even know your name at the certain given time. So having a much more open, uh, open format of introductions or simply even inviting people to be like if you want to introduce yourself twice or have multiple people in your system introduce yourselves if you happen to be plural go for it those are all things that invite plural people to introduce themselves more authentically in your spaces um, and then thirdly our third suggestion is to ask who you're talking to and to have a culture of naming yourself when you speak um, if it's been a while since you've speak or if you're entering the space uh, for a, a new time, for example, if you have a meeting that meets regularly once a week, instead of after three weeks, stop uh, stopping introducing yourself, introduce yourself every time you enter that space. Because, uh, it, for example, plural people might, it might be a different person showing up to that space every time. And if they're the only person introducing themselves every week, then it can feel a little bit alienating and a little bit weird for them to be introducing themselves every time. Um, this is also something that makes the space more accessible uh, for blind or autistic folks or people who share those identities or uh, a number of other disabled folks who might find this more useful. So uh, active support, um, this is, things that uh, you can do um, once people have entered your spaces and once you're interacting with them regularly, uh, just ongoing things. Um, so first of all, going along with the using of multiple names, uh, allowing the use of multiple pronouns, changing pronouns and creating an environment where systems can generally switch freely. Um, just being prepared that um, who you're talking to right now might not be who you're talking to a few minutes from now. Um, and being accommodating to uh, changing needs as the system switches. For example, if um, if a uh, an adult is fronting for, you know, for an hour that you're hanging out with the person and then um, for a little bit, a child switches in, depending on how uh, the system is, has instructed you to treat that child, you may need to switch to more child-friendly topics and child-friendly language. Um, and just being open to the possibility that things may change. Um, and similarly, uh, continue to ask who you're talking to. Um, not, you know, at the end of every sentence, not, not every two minutes, but, you know, every once in a while... Um, if things feel a bit different about that person, asking is never a bad thing. Um, 
uh, we like to say just because you met someone once uh, doesn't mean that you know their name. That sort of uh, singlet normativity uh, breaking idea that um, if somebody uh, enters your space, it might not be the same person that you saw in that body the last time they were there. Um, when uh, doing prompts as well, um, invite multiple people in the system to share on prompts. Um, we go to a uh, trans support group um, and uh, we do a, a check in at the beginning of the session where we talk, where we, um, first of all, we always introduce our name and pronouns and uh, then we do uh, high of the week, low of the week, etc. And um, we uh, will sometimes, if there are multiple people there, do that check in for multiple people. Just say, you know, uh, hi, it's Camilla. My high of the week was this. Um, Sandra's high of the week was this. Um, and just uh, allowing space for that. Um, and um, accommodating for switches also means um, uh, allowing time for systems to make more decisions. Um, sometimes there will be rapidly changing answers to a question that you ask. And uh, because system members are talking amongst themselves and uh, trying to come to a consensus. So just, you know, if it's not an urgent situation, allowing room to consider the answer as a whole. Um, and uh, similarly, uh, reminders, extra notifications, and understanding when memory issues arise. Uh, especially for DID systems, OSDD systems as well. Um, amnesia is a um, significant part of DID and to a degree OSDD. Um, uh, there is often um, a, a lack of memory communication between two different system members, um, especially towards the beginning of discovery. It can be hard to uh, keep those uh, to, to get those barriers down right away. Um, so just uh, being forgiving if uh, if something uh, is forgotten and just reminding of things coming up and uh, just giving people a little more leeway on those sort of things. I think there's a very nasty holdover from abled society and ableist society specifically where... Uh, saying I forgot is very much equated to saying I didn't care. Um, when honestly, it often does mean I forgot, even for singlets. And then something else you can do to support plural people is just engage in continual learning about our experiences. Um, I think something that's really salient for us on this topic is learning and using our language. Uh, we did go over some basic definitions at the beginning of this presentation, but I want to make it very clear that that is just skimming the surface of our experience and the language we use to describe our experience, especially for folks who have a really um, a broad spectrum of conceptualization ourselves and conceptualizing our differentiation, the language between systems who are very distinct with their system members and system systems who don't have very distinct system members that language can change a lot between the two of them um so learn the language le learn our language and specifically learn the language used by system members you know, by plural people who uh exist in your spaces because very simply the burden of explaining shouldn't rest on marginalized folks to explain the the basic language that other people can use to understand their experience um i think something that is very salient for us with this is that in a lot of our mental health spaces where there's people with a whole bunch of um, mental health, uh, mental illnesses that are mixed together in one space, who are all supporting on each other and talking about our experiences, it is very hard for us as a plural system to authentically talk about our experiences in those spaces. Because, for example, if we talk about something a negative experience that happened a week ago. We could say something like, 
oh, we were cooking dinner and like halfway through cooking, like Lorianne really wanted to front and she just like pushed right up in the front and in the co-conscious and she was really like exerting a lot of passive influence on me. And I was starting to feel really disconnected and dissociated and just wasn't grounded in the space and uh, communication got cut off between system members and I wasn't able to talk with other people. I wasn't, our internal communication was just shot and then we all just ended up as a very blurry mushy blob um it's very likely that people that i'm sharing the space with uh might not even understand what i'm saying because language such as switching co-fronting um co-conscious blurry passive influence internal communication are words that they don't understand it they don't know they don't know what it means and they don't know why in the context those words could have a negative effect on our health and those experiences could have a negative effect on our health. Um, so if that burden rests entirely on the shoulders of plural people, it's entirely possible they just might not talk about their experiences at all because it's so much effort to explain every little bit of your experience to other people constantly. When you want to talk to anyone at all, talk about anything, even the little tiny things, the little joyous things that happen in our life, that burden of explaining is a heavy one. And being able to take that burden off their shoulders is something that can cre let plural people just open up so much more in your spaces. And then secondly, if you have plural people in your spaces, if they've disclosed, disclosed their plurality to you, listen to them and learn from what they specifically would like you to improve. Um, this is simply because each and every system is unique and we're all different in this community. It's very diverse, very broad community. And that means that we all have different ways of being and interacting in spaces, and we all have different accommodations that we need. Um, for example, we have talked about, we have brought up a lot of these accessibility issues or like suggestions for systems who tend to be very differentiated, very bold, want to engage in spaces as themselves authentically. Not everyone is going to be in that space. Internalized ableism is very heavy, masking is very heavy, or some people just might not have a very differentiated experience. So there are plural systems who might not want to name themselves, who might not want to use their, a system name, who might not have individual names, who might not even want to identify um, different system members when they exist in this space. They might just want to be seen as plural and like not get too much deeper than that. Or there's, there's just so many different options. Um, so when you are interacting with plural people in your spaces, make sure that you offer opportunities to express themselves but know that they might not take them. And especially if they don't take them, or always actually, interact with them and ask them how they would like you to make their space more accommodating for them specifically. And then finally, you're learning now. Thank you so much for attending the workshop. Uh, but basically I wanna say don't stop here because plurality is this really complex internal experience that's very hard for singlets to grasp. Um, and this workshop isn't gonna cover everything you need to know. Um, it's a really great introduction. Thank you for being here, but don't let it stop. Thank you, that's all. <laughs> um, so let's do a final uh, discussion here. Um, let's talk about an action plan. Uh, think about the spaces that you inhabit and what is something that you can do to make one of those uh, spaces more friendly to plural folks. And once again, we are going to uh, Popcorn, whoever uh, wants to start uh, one thing that was actually typed a few a uh, couple minutes before we gave that prompt, but is still very much relevant here uh, in group settings, for example, leading classrooms with group work, um, would it be sensible to ask something along the lines of please introduce yourself with the name or names and pronouns that are fitting uh, for this moment? And I think that that's um, I think that that would be very, very appropriate. That's a really good suggestion. I'm going to write that down. Uh, plural kit. Um, adding plural kit to your servers is uh, on Discord is definitely something that you can do to uh, let systems know that this is a place where you can uh, be more open with it, even really having to say it. Uh, talk more about plurality, um, so plurals know the area is safe for them and that you know about plurality. Yes, just just kind of sharing that you are. Um, that you know about systems or that you know a system, something something like that in general, can make things feel safer. Asking plurals in your life what would help them in group settings, yes. Because honestly, as much as 
as we can list, you know, all of the things that we can mm -hmm. think of, we could make a nine hour presentation and not cover everything because, you know, every system is unique. Every system wants to be interacted with in a specific way, I feel. So I believe with that, we're going to move on to resources. Yeah. Um, as a final note, before we head out, uh, we just want to give you some resources. And instead of giving you the slide and leaving you to explore them by yourself, I'm just going to give you a little bit of description for all of them, because a lot of these are very close and dear to our heart. And um, giving you a little roadmap, I feel like might encourage you to engage with them more. <laughs> so um, we're going to start with websites. Uh, more than one dot info is this lovely, cute little website that's very basic, very simple. It's something that we give to people who have um, no understanding of plurality, never heard of it before. It's just a very nice little introduction to the concept. And it like gives you a lot of nice little outlines and it takes you through a very similar thing as what we did in the beginning of this presentation. And it's great to just give to people as an introduction. Pluralactivism.card.co is a resource that was created by us and the Alexandrite system. Um, and it details, uh, it has four sections. It has solidarity readings. It has the history of plural activism. It has important uh, readings and writings uh, from plural activists, and it has a list of activists, organizations, and ways to get involved. Um, and it's just this compilation of our work. It leads you to the other activists and all their writings, so you can follow them, so you can get in touch with them, so you can look at their work. Um, it's just kind of a little hub for all that stuff. Uh, there's also polycordial.wixsite.com slash bones. Um, this was written by the Polycordial system and it was just recently posted. Uh, they're also singers and songwriters, which is lovely. Um, but this is a website that they made uh, to introduce their audience, uh, their singing and songwriting audience to plurality. So it has um, Q&A and interviews with them. It has another history of plurality from a uh, medicalized and non-medicalized perspective. It's a lovely list of citations and more resources you can follow up with. Um, then finally, there's the Plurality Playbook, which was created by the Irenes and Freya et al. It was actually created um, within Google, the organization, the company, um, as a training guide for singlet employees um, to teach them how to respectfully interact with their plural coworkers. Um, so it's just this lovely like introduction to plurality, and it teaches you how to interact respectfully and like what are some main key ideas and all of that. Um, highly recommend looking through, it's great work. There's also the System Speak podcast, which is ran by Dr. Emma Sunshaw, which has a whole bunch of guests, really lovely. Um, for books, we recommend Amongst Ourself and Got Parts, uh, which are two self-help guides to DID. Um, you don't have to have DID to read them. Um, and on top of that, in Amongst Ourselves, there are specific chapters for friends and family members of plural folks. Uh, but either way, it's a lovely insight to what life looks like, what uh, lived experience with plurality, specifically DID looks like. And then there's Telling Without Talking, which is art therapy and DID book. And then finally, last and most importantly, there's lovely organizations out there doing plural activism, doing amazing work. Um, first off, there's the Plural Association, they're a um, relatively recent organization founded by our friend, the Stronghold System in the Netherlands. Uh, they have a nonprofit plural warm line, kind of like a hotline, but a little chiller um, that's set to launch anytime now. Uh, they got a lot of funding over the COVID, over the past year. I'm going to say the past year, no COVID in this presentation. <laughs> um, but they do a lot of advocacy work, um, organizing uh, workshops, presentations, all sorts of stuff. First plur Person Plural focuses a lot on the DID experience. They are a much older organization since the late 1990s. They do a lot of trainings and workshops on DID and have a lot of great content. An Infinite Mind is US-based. Um, they are inactive most of the year, but every February they have a really large conference uh, centered on DID and the plural experience. Um, we've been a couple times, it's been an interesting space to take part of, but it's definitely something that has been very historic for our community. And then finally, in Australia, there's the Dissociative Initiative, um, which runs uh, support groups, it does workshops, it does organizing, and other activism work in Australia for people with DID or who experience plurality or hearing voices, all wrapped up into one gorgeous little package. 
And then finally, uh, we're going to open it up to questions. Does anyone have any questions for us? We're here to answer them. We always love hearing them. And uh, again, if you feel more comfortable in the chat, go right ahead. Big thank you, by the way, to uh, the River System, who uh, is recording this for us because uh, both the, the Ring System and us have issues with um, with using OBS and Discord and showing the slides at the same time. Yeah, so, we, we tried to do a live stream on YouTube once, which is our video, Alexander's video, OBS, and the YouTube tab, and our computer just crashed so fast. <laughs> Bad. So yeah, um, if you're watching this right now and you were not here live, it is because of them. <laughs> How can healthcare providers mitigate the damage of choosing one name to represent your system as a component of your medical record? Slash, how can we make our patients aware that if we include names in our medical records, in our medical record, it becomes permanent and may potentially out you to subsequent providers? That is a difficult question. I mean, my first instinct is to just ask that question to the patient. Um, yeah. Because, like, for example, some systems might be so out and open that they want those names in their permanent med medical record because they might already have DID in their permanent med medical record and it outs them all the time anyways. Um, so I think asking them that question, because some people might be like, yeah, put some names in there. And some, pe some people might be like, no, don't put names in there, just informally. Um, and then I think a lot of times, like mirroring language, like so if they refer to themselves as plural, mirror that language, um, gently ask, like, uh, do you want to identify who's fronting to me? Um, and like really kind of being receptive on that plural, um, on that plural vibe, like really letting them know that like you see them for who they are, you see them as the authentic people they are, can help mitigate a lot of that damage. I don't know if that was angry system thoughts. No, I, I think you covered it. Just ask, ask him, it, ask that to them verbally, and like, mm -hmm. honestly, a lot of these, uh, a lot of that can just be just ask. Like we said, no system, uh, we we can't possibly cover like every desire of every system in here, so it's always best to ask. Mm -hmm. Privately, if you can. So, I believe uh, that's it. So, thank you, everyone here. Um, this was uh, this was good. I think this I think this dress rehearsal went uh, very well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for all showing up and yeah. supporting and all that stuff. Yeah, I finally caught up with the chat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think we can also stop recording then for River System. Yes. Thank you, River System.